Hello and welcome again to the second lecture of our 2015 George Rollick Memorial Series in the Acadia Center for Baptist and Anabaptist Studies. We continue with our lecturer, Dr. Andrea Struben, who in this lecture addresses the topic, A Rocky and Winding Road, The Course of Women in Ministry in the German Baptist Context. I'm also pleased to announce that during the lectures, at a regular meeting of our administrative committee, Dr. Struben was elected unanimously our second fellow of the Center for Baptist and Anabaptist Studies. Congratulations to her as she comes to deliver her second lecture. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, my esteemed colleagues, I would like to thank you from my heart for the generous invitation to talk with you today about a topic that was very special and, and that has a very special personal significance for me. At the same time, I have to confess that I'm not able to refer to a string of academic research projects with respect to this selected topic. Instead, I'm going to enter uncharted territory to some extent and present to you both part of a part of my own biography and modern history at the same time. I will start with, the, with my bio biography. My family is able to look back over five generations of membership in Baptist congregations. This is quite unusual for Germany, and all the more so because the first Baptist congregations has, um, were only established from the early mid-19th century, and in comparison to the do two dominant churches, the Roman Catholic and the National Protestant Church, the Baptist Church has never moved beyond the status of a minority church. In ecumenical conversations, I need to recount from time to time that my great-grandmother even had to spend in jail, a time in jail, because her mother had become a Baptist and had refused to get her children baptized. Since my childhood, therefore, I have always been very aware of my unique confessional rules. Furthermore, my father was a minister in a large and well-known Baptist congregation in Hamburg until 1968, when he was called to take on work as a director in the Diakoniewerk Bethel in Berlin. Naturally, the entire family went with him to Berlin. Both of my elder sisters studied theology and became religious teachers. Thus, community, theology, and pastoral life were constant coordinates in my early biography. I have passed through all the stages of a typical career in the Baptist Church, from Sunday school programs for children and youth, to choir and missionary activities. However, there was one thing I was sure I did not want to become another theologian in the family tradition. And yet, I experienced a very clear calling and in a peculiar way against my own will during a youth lesson in 1982. Initially, this came as a shock to my parents, all the more so given that ordained female pastors did not yet exist at the, time, at the time in our Baptist Convention in Germany. However, women had been allowed to study theology since 1976 at church-owned seminaries and at universities, even though they were not to work as pastors in German Baptist churches. <coughs> I began to study theology in spite of all the objections at the Kirchliche Hochschule Ecclesiastical University in Berlin, and to be on the safe side, I studied history at the same time. 
I studied with great enthusiasm. <coughs> I discovered the wide scope of theological findings and in 1990 earned my doctorate. My speciality is church history, as you know. After some initial hesitation, mostly because of the insecure professional future, but not so much as a result of any theological concerns, my parents wholeheartedly supported my, supported my studies with love and energy. A year abroad in 1985-86 on a scholarship at the Hebrew University in Israel introduced me to the lasting relationship of Jews and Christian in history. And to this very day, I seek to promote its dialogue. After my studies and graduation, I took up a position as vicar in a Baptist church in Berlin that was connected to a hospital and therefore primarily well welfare and socially oriented. During my university studies, I had had my first attempts at writing and preaching sermons. The liturg liturgical forum of many experienced female deacons and missionaries was not always easy. People generally did not beat about the bush with praise and criticism. I will never forget, forget my ordination service in 1991. To that point in time, my former husband and I had undertaken and achieved everything together and in parallel time with regard to our studies, internships, and doctorates. Now, however, we were to receive different ordination certificates, which would give my former husband all the rights and obligations as a fully-fledged pastor, but for me, as a so-called theological co-worker, I would merely receive permission to instruct children, the youth, and the needy. Our vicariate tutor firmly refused to carry out the discriminatory differentiation during the inauguration and therefore did not read my ordination certificate out loud. Nonetheless, I was in fact ordained just three years later as a fully qualified pastor because in the period following my ordination, a corresponding provision had been enforced for Baptist churches in Germany. Appointment as a pastor was a long and rocky trail. I cannot recollect how many lectures and talks I gave up and down the country in these years about the role of women in biblical context. Sometimes I was even confronted with open aggression, aggression in these discussions and encounters, mostly from people who feared that the authority of the Holy Scripture, scripture and the supposedly biblically prescribed role of the women, women would be questioned by a critical comprehension of the Bible. At the same time, I always had many supporters who were full of appreciation for my preaching and my pastoral commitment. In addition to my pastoral work in the church, I ran an academic research project as part of my postdoctoral <coughs> grant on the history of the Reformation, the Anabaptist movement in Switzerland. For a long time, I led a double life, undertaking academic work in research and teaching, as well as the everyday work of a pastor. And yet both these very different <coughs> lifestyles mutually complemented and enriched my life. In 1996, my former husband and I were appointed as a pastor couple in Munich. I was the first female pastor in Bavaria and was thus confronted once again with discussions over the issue of the pastoral service of women. For my father, former husband and me, it was always of great importance that we have had the same rights and duties in the field of pastoral work. 
And this is what we communicated very clearly from the beginning when accepting the call. They would only have us double-sized. This was a leaning, le learning process for the congregation, which turned out to be very positive right from the very beginning. The only problems for me occurred at funerals because in the strongly Bavarian Catholic tradition, a woman as a priest and above all without a rope, a cross bearer and altar boys was exceptionally uncommon. In a senior citizen home, when we frequently held services, a female resident once said goodbye to me with a grateful handshake and a humble look on her face. And, he sa and she said, goodbye, father. <laughs> <laughs> I did not correct the wrong gender title, but considered it a compliment. Since 2006, I have been a full professor for church history at Oldenburg University. My long-term experience as a pastor helps me a lot in dealing with our students and, therefore, I would not have missed it for the world. I would like um, to introduce you to the history of German Baptists and the role of um, women in this um, history. And at first, I just want to present you some insights about the early phase and the early stage of the uh, foundation era, you may, might say, of the German Baptist. Anyone who takes a closer look into the history of the German Baptist Church inevitably encounters description that basically do not include women at all, or where women are simply either mentioned in the role of wife or as figures performing some task or other in the background. For my free church, which fundamentally see itself as a missionary activist community movement, reflection of its own history has always only been of secondary importance. With the exception of the Mennonites in Germany who can lay lay claim to a long tradition of historical research into their heritage, the original awakening is characteristic for the free church self-perception in Germany, not so much the, the search for historical continuities. This applies to both the link to the universal history of Christian faith as well to its own history. Notably, the founders of the German Baptist tradition do not play a major role in the church teachings and practice, nor does the location of its own tradition in the context of the Reformation have a particular prominent profile. In my opinion, the German Baptist Church lacks a fundamental understanding of its origins and the interconnection with its Anglo-American early history, which very likely holds interesting and challenging powers. The lack of a memorial or comm commemorative culture <coughs> correlates to the lack of historical awareness. There are almost no specific sites of Baptist commemoration or even those exi existing locations are rarely utilized for collective remembrance. Anniversaries frequently pass without any great notice or attention. However, despite this general forgetfulness with regard to history, there is a memory of the foundation period of the German Baptist congregation and in this respect, it was primarily men who played the leading role. The leading role. The history of the German Baptist Church is inseparably connected with one name, Johann Gerhard Onkel, who on the basis on traditional distinctions 
has <coughs> entered the denominational memory of entire generations of Baptists as a tireless missionary, founding father, and as Max Weber said, religious virtuoso. However, this image has, was expanded relatively quickly to form the so-called clover leaf or trio, which included two <coughs> other founding fathers, characters, <coughs> Julius Köpner and Gottfried Wilhelm Lehmann. Here they are. <coughs> As a result of their differing religious socialization and theological stances, this founding generation contributed from early on to a core of internal differentiation within the Baptist Church. In a close interrelationship with the Anglo-Saxon revivalist movement, which believed that it had a responsibility for the evangelization of the continent, all the classic free churches began to emerge in Germany from the 1830s. On the one hand, these were sent to Germany as German representatives of various tract and Bible societies. Consequently, the founding fathers of the different free churches initially operated as non-denominational emissary, emissaries from the Anglo-Saxon revivalist movement, whereby they typically utilized the newest organization forms missionary methods and communication networks that were characteristic for the revivalist movements, the societies. On the other hand, a number of Germans who had previously immigrated to England or the USA and joined free churches there returned to their homeland as missionaries. One page is missing. That's not good. Oh, I found it. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> Although the initial aim was first and foremost to offer the German revivalist organizational, spiritual, and financial assistance, the reality of migrants to Germany and Germans returning home meant that free church ideas gradually prevailed over the early years. The commitment of German-speaking sister churches proved to be a further important prerequisite for the emergence of the free churches in Germany. From the mid-18s, migrants who had joined the already established free churches in the States financed German missions which quickly discarded their non-denominational orientation and transformed their mission into a strategic implanting of their prospective free church into Germany. In addition to this undeniable connection to the Anglo-Saxon revivalist movement and the network of relationships with the already established sister denominations in England and in the States, it is important to consider the significance of conventical bodies within the development history of the free churches in Germany. The formation of revivalist converticles and the free socialization in independent church associations proved to be a spiritual breeding ground for the separation of regional church structures. These revivalist conventicles, together with associations organized under private law and the network of relationships that emerged from the Bible society were of the greatest Catholic significance. Their revivalist ecumenism primarily caused an activation of the lay people. The fellowship of like-minded people on the basis of voluntary membership was an important prerequisite for the development of a genuine free church ecclesiology. It was only a small step from these private communities to a free church, often only requiring an organizational impulse or external ideological or financial support. 
the German Baptist Church is particularly affected by these roots in the revivalist movement. The founder of the German Baptist Church, Johann Gerhard Omten, returned to Germany in 1823 as an agent and Bible colporteur for a non-denominational oriented Bible and tract society after he had experienced his conversion as a consequence of contacts with the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Scotland and the Methodists in London. The foundation of the community and Onken's subsequent ordination were implemented under the leadership of the Baptist Professor of Theology, Barna Sears from Hamilton, New York, who was living in Germany at the time for the purpose of research. After the foundation of the First Baptist Congregation in 1834, Onken came into conflict with the organization that had originally sent him out to Germany. This organization withdrew his financial support as a result of his breach of the convertical legislation as well as the baptism of believers that both he and the first congregation members underwent whereupon he raised his money henceforth from Bible societies in the United States. Onken maintained contact with rivalist, revivalist circles and conventicles across Germany through the various societies and was re-owned as a successful evangelist and colporteur for the different Bible societies as well as for facilitating the distribution of their publications to a wide circle of people. This network later became valuable for the process of expansion, particularly as many of these circles had had emerged independent of the Baptist mission, subsequently became the building blocks of Baptist congregation as a direct result of Ogden's commitment. Here you can see um, the first um, paper of membership or certificate of membership in the first Baptist congregation in Berlin. The involvement of women in the revivalist conventicles that later formed into Baptist congregation has not yet been a subject of research. I can, however, it can, however, be demonstrated that women were members of the earliest, earliest circles and were baptized into the Baptist congregations and communities. Furthermore, two women were part of the first Baptist congregation that was created through the baptism of seven members in Hamburg in 1834. Two of the seven first members were women. One of them was Sarah Onken. <coughs> Sarah Onken. She was uh, born as Sarah Mann. And the other one was Henriette Lange, the wife of one of the other workmen baptized that very first day. Onken and his colleague collaborated closely with various missionary Bible and tract society, which respectively <coughs> provided donation and final contribution for their mission or missionary work in Germany. Both English and American missionary societies sent German staff members as their missionaries to the different regions of Germany. These were often workers who, in part, had also been educated in England. Alternately, their organization agreed to on the selections of competent staff members that he recruited from the early congregations. Hamburg, as the first city of German baptism, developed into the headquarters of the missionary work and that of the surrounding country, countries. As early as 1836, Onken reported that some 16 people, men as well as some women, were actively working alongside him as missionaries. 
These fellow workers <coughs> reported on individual prayer meetings, missionary activities, christenings, and the foundation of new congregations. Without doubt, it was these international relationships that made it possible for there to be a strategic expansion and consolidation of the German Baptist Church. Up to now, this really has not been sufficiently acknowledged. From the beginning, the Baptist congregations were confronted by official repression and state church defamination. The era of persecution, including J terms, forced christenings of children, seizures, and ban of assemblies created a large degree of awareness of identity and cohesion for the newly emerging congregations. It becomes apparent with any analysis of the records of this period that women frequently became the primary victims of the continuing discrimination. They consistently proved themselves steadfast holding firm to the faith that they recognized and practiced, even though they had to endure seizures, detention, and expulsion as a result. One example. At just 19 years of age, the unmarried Caroline Henriette Bethmann gave birth to a daughter on the 2nd November 1849. The regional church pastor Heike from Luther am Barenberge lodged a formal complaint in October 1852, some three years after the child's birth, with a relevant church authority regarding the mother's refusal to have the child christened, reporting, you can read here, she has converted to the Anabaptists and considers the christening of children to be a sin, which is why she had had her child blessed by a preacher from her belief and named the child Caroline. Thus, the pastor requested further instruction as to how he should proceed and whether the mother, I quote, could be compelled by the police to have her child belatedly christened. Quote, end. The result was a forced christening on the direction of the police. In 1856, the subsequently married young mother was forced to acquiesce to a further forced christening of her child. Time and again, entries can be found confirming how courageous women in this founding generation were forced to accept social discrimination. One woman, Mrs. Thompson, did not want her children to be instructed on the Lutheran Catechism, four days jail. The same woman participated in Baptist worship <coughs> services, six-day jail, and seizure of money to cover legal costs. Women also served as readers of sermons and leaders of edification meetings, for which they were brought before the courts and often sentenced to jail for several weeks. Thus, women had had an active interest in the early period of the German Baptist Church, whereby they assumed leading roles in the various revivalist circles and the foundation of the first congregations. There are also many references in commemorative publications of various congregations to how women clearly belong to the founding figures of the Baptist congregations. Not at least of all is the congregation in Munich in which I worked as pastor for 11 years, which was founded by a woman. This congregation can be traced back to the commitment of the widow Margarete Schöninger, who moved with her son August from Bayreuth to Munich in May 1895 at the age of 45 years. 
Immediately after her move, she began her missionary works from her home. The Baptist missionary mission's most important tool was the personal invitation to missionary events taking place in private homes before congregational houses were established in a community. The personal nature of this testimony of belief was so effective precisely because of the inviting appeal. The immediacy of receiving salvation, relying on no means of grace other than the Bible, and presented in a clear and understandable way by simple men and women, was particularly persuasive, especially for citizens, citizens from the lower classes. While church preaching remained a privilege solely for ordained male priests, tract mission and personal testimonials could, come to, could become a tool of persuasion and commitment to belief in the hand of every person. Margarete Schöninger distributed, distributed many such tracts, collected children playing on the streets into her Sunday school, and openly issued invitations to Bible studies and prayer meetings in her front room. The next step was the holding of public worship services, and it was hoped to gain thereby recognition as a private church society. I sincerely believe that these beginnings should not be overlooked in the discussion of the long development towards the ordination of women and the introduction of the office of female pastors in the German Baptist Union. Unfortunately, these courageous women, with their vision and astounding degree of persistence, are only thought of a rare occasion. Like many religious movements and awakenings, an egalitarian spirit dominated in the infancy of the German Baptist Church, highlighting the charismatic equality of the children of God, of men and women likewise, in direct contrast to the social convention at the time. In this respect, women played a significant role in the emergent German Baptist Church. However, with the foundation of the Free Church, this transcendence of the traditional understanding of roles in the sense of a precedence of missionary goals gradually retreated. <coughs> in the beginning, the German Baptist Church assumed the egalitarian and anti-hierarchical tendency of the worldwide Baptist Church. The congregational ecclesiology, which was based on the autonomy of the local congregation, led to the consistent rejection of church offices. The priesthood of all believers should comprehensively prevail, and this incorporated women in the early period. While the Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-American spheres adhered to the core understanding of the importance of the pastor, this high regard for the office diminished in the German Baptist Church as a consequence of the strong influence of the revivalist movement. From the beginning, however, the training of missionary workers for the expanding Baptist movement in Germany was endorsed. As early as the first national conference of Baptist congregation in Germany in 1849, this was the foundation year, of the Confederation, it was decided that training courses for missionaries should be established. But even here, the exclusive restriction to men or brothers was already made apparent. It will not in any way by the intention of the assembled gathering to make the effectiveness of the kingdom of God dependent on any specific teaching, just as we have not done up to now, whereby every true child of God will potentially be able to achieve something 
and the equipping from above remains continuously that on which everything depends. The instruction should proceed in the most important issues only where required so that the trainee missionary obtains the competency to be able to express himself correctly and properly on the topic. One should definitely declare that you, such brothers, who are universally recognized as those favored by the congregation, are being sent out by us to expand the kingdom of God. And to these brothers, if it possible, the most necessary preparatory instruction should be imparted, but that the latter is not a law. It is recognizable, recognizable in these statements that the training was seen as being contradict contradictory to some extent to the free effectiveness of the charismatically understood service of all members. With respect to the state church, meticulous attention was paid to ensuring this did, that this did not lead to the development of the office of pastor. Only ordinary people, not scholars, should be considered for the preaching of the gospel, in direct contrast to the state church and its university education. The more educated, the more inappropriate. Nonetheless, it is interesting that this self-same conference requested that congregations select brothers and sisters who would commit themselves to the mission and should collect for it, including cash management. But the full-time missionary workers and those who were to be trained and educated were to be exclusively men. Under the intense influence of American Baptists with German origins, including, among others, August Rauschenbusch, the missionary causes ultimately led to the creation of a missionary school and then a school for the training of preachers founded in 1880. The ever greater qualification to study theology was entirely restricted to men. Unfortunately, this constrains me that I cannot explore the developments in the understanding of the office today, despite them being struggling, truly, ex uh, despite them being truly exciting. In 1921, plans were initiated for the establishment of a seminary for women, which nevertheless could effectively only be characterized as a Bible school. Until well into the 1960s, there was obviously no serious consideration as to whether women should be admitted to the study of theology or for the office of pastor. In the foundation era of the German free churches in the early mid 19th century, there were diverse realizations of charitable responsibility in the congregational context. Charitable and missionary activities were closely linked in the emerging free churches' congregations and were practiced by members in various organizational forms. At the first national conference, Onken even pointed out that the office of deaconess had not been yet, <coughs> had not been yet considered or recognized, which he perceived to be a serious deficiency. At the, at, the first, at the turn of the century, the influence of mother house deaconry was increasingly being felt in the free church deaconry. The mother house deaconry described the, diaconic, the dia, diaconal or social and welfare commitment of women, which is based on a community of belief, life and service like a holy order. In 1836, the first deaconess mother house was established by Theodor Fliedner and his wife Friederike in Kaiserswerth near Düsseldorf, followed by many similar establishments across all Germany. 
unmarried women learned a profession in nursing or education. At the same time, they lived together as deaconesses in the community of the mother house. The women developed a strong community of belief, life, and service. The training facility was based on the basic idea of the family, whose nucleus was formed by the house father, the director, and the house mother, to which also came the daughter sisters, the deaconesses, and further employees. The conservative, bourgeois image of the women still remained in place, where a woman's actual occupation should be in the family as housewife and mother. Fliegner transferred the family structure to his deaconry initiative, the mother house thereby creating a new space for the social care occupations for unmarried women. Nevertheless, female deaconry is inseparably linked to religious motivating women's search for self-determination. Fliedner's real achievement was not so much the revival of the apostolic office of deaconess, but his facilitation, facilitation of the integration and appreciation of unmarried women within the church. As deaconesses, unmarried women were granted social acceptance and legal security, as well as new opportunities for education and the possibility of practicing a profession. In spite of its initial openness to the revival of the office of deaconess, the Federation of Baptist Congregation blocked the actual establishment of deaconess mother houses for many decades. A first attempt was made in 1885 by the married couple Bertha and Eduard Schäve to initiate a deaconess home based on a mother's association for the loving and rescue work for the poor, sick, and needy. In 1887, the first Baptist deaconess home named Bethel was created from this social welfare, welfare work. One co-founder was a former Kaiserswerth deaconess. Subsequently, within the Federation of Baptist Congregation, the social and welfare work organization Tabea and Siloa known as the Albertinen House since 1941, was created, which still exists today. In all three churches, the development of the mother house deaconry took place along a similar pattern. Here you can see the mother house of the first um, deaconess's um, house in Bethel, Berlin. Generally, a small circle of sisters, on occasions, the foundation of an institute even took place on the basis of just one sister, was offer offered nursing training in a state-owned hospital. Subsequently, they would put this training into practice in domestic nursing for the poor and private citizens. In the difficulty starting period, where each establishment was confronted with financial location and staffing challenges, all mother houses entirely devoted themselves to nursing in the domestic sector and the employment of sisters in city hospitals as well as private clinics. In various locations, the rapidly increasing numbers of sisters led to some city hospitals being entirely staffed by deaconesses as well as the complete takeover of head nurse roles, quickly creating the desire for the creation of dedicated facilities for their field of work. Around the turn of the century, some deaconess houses actually succeeded in building their own hospitals with schools of nursing, most likely conditional to the church-wide responsibility for the facilities, while other organizations were able to take control of self-governing hospital work in the late 1920s and the period of the Nazi dictatorship. This is not the place for tracing the different histories 
of the individual deaconess houses and their mother superiors or sisterhoods. It is, however, indisputable that the office of deaconess, with its outstanding training and widely varying areas of application in social welfare, nursing, and in service to the community, exerted a decisive influence on the role of women in the Baptist, German Baptist congregation. Even the general sister played an important role in congregations and frequently assumed leadership responsibilities. In this respect, I would like to share with you the example of the founder of the Deaconess House, Siloa, Albertine Assoa, as a successful businesswoman in the fashion industry, she soon became involved in the area of social responsibility in the context of various Baptist congregations. She worked as a so-called Gemeindeschwester, community nurse in the congregation, as a city missionary and welfare worker in Stade near Hamburg. In 1902, she followed her vocation as Mother Superior in the Tabea Deaconess House that had no long been established in Hamburg Altona, where a prior series of conflicts had resulted in there being only three remaining sisters. As a self-confident woman, Albert, woman, Albertina Assoa quickly came into conflict with the male management of the Deaconess House. She undertook extended journeys to persuade young women to consider the option of becoming a deaconess. She tirelessly established a network of contacts and for the deaconesses she acquired private nursing positions with doctors through the position carrying of the city's poor. In 1903, a training course for female city, mission, city missionaries and community helpers was established. Women were sent out from these courses as city missionaries. In the meantime, As Albertina Assor had begun to manage the sisterhood independently, including all financial affairs, which ultimately led to an unsurmountable quarrel with a male inspector. The conflict can be attributed to their differing understanding of the mission statement of the deaconesses and a dispute over their respective areas of authority with regard to leadership issues. In 1907, she resigned from Tabea together with seven sisters and established her own deaconess house under the name Siloa. After just one and a half years, some 22 sisters had joined the independent sisterhood. The Deaconess House Tabea came close to going out of existence as a result of this division. Further activities included the taking over of a girls' school, provision for deaconesses with regard to employee insurance, the foundation of an own mother house the opening of a nursing school, guest houses and rest houses for deaconesses, and the establishment of a dedicated hospital and other clinics under the Nazi dictatorship. Another field was the mission, another important area leading to the establishing of full-time employment and occupations for women in the Baptist Federation of Germany was the overseas mission. Germany had not been a traditional colonial power, as you know, only coming into possession of colonies in Africa towards the end of the 19th century, after it had become clear that the power positions of European states were dependent on their territories outside of Europe. Germany acquired territories in 1884-85 that were still under British or French rule. German East Africa, German Southwest Africa, Togo, and Cameroon. Up to this time, German Baptists had not established any independent global missionary initiatives. 
choosing instead to support already existing initiatives such as the Sinana mission in India. In Cameroon, which had become a German colony in 1884, the British Baptist sold the local work area to the Basel mission leading to tensions with the existing indigenous Baptist congregations. From 1891, German Baptists sent out the first missionaries. In their work, they particularly concentrated on building girls' schools, a novelty in this region, that were managed by female German missionaries like Frieda Lutz or Dora Karls. Female missionaries played a leading role in the German Baptist Cameroon mission. Most of the missionaries there were women. From 1927, the so-called women's service, Frauendienst, formed an intrinsic and from the beginning an autonomously structured area of church involvement. The German Baptist Church had already created a range of girls and women's associations that were directed by educated and self-confident women from the congregational communities. For example, Frieda Fetzer, née Rauschenbusch, daughter of August Rauschenbusch and sister of Walter Rauschenbusch. They had separate structures of their disposal, publication, media, co-workers, and they were also in full-time and inter-congregational service. Women who were active in the women's service were also involved in youth work, which was likewise organized on an inter-congregational basis. I come to an interim conclusion. Because of their deaconry, mission, and congregational women's and youth work, women in positions of responsibility were well regarded and respected by the congregational community. The full-time service of women had established itself within a specific framework to which a range of assertive, assertive and capable women had contributed. These are a few aspects of a history that had yet to be written. The history has not been mentioned, even mentioned the women pastors who unquestionably stood for the men who had been called up during the Second World War, no least undertaking their preaching duties. The study of theology and the office of pastor nevertheless remained out of reach for Baptist women until the early 1970s. Even though there have been discussions in the 1920s regarding the establishment of a dedicated women's seminary and the education and further training of women and men at a youth seminary had been facilitated since the 1960s, women were still excluded from the study of theology and service as a pastor. When faced with the calls for reform and student protests, the Federal Council, the highest decision-making body of the Free Church, set up two working groups in May 1973, charged with providing advice on the service of women in the church community. The following year, the Federal Council resolved at its meeting. I quote, The Federal Council does not intend to establish the office of a female pastor. As a rule, the theolo theological seminary does not provide theological education for women. It justified individual cases the church leadership can permit women to undertake theological study or variable duration at the seminary. Assuming a there is a clear understanding regarding the career goal. The desired service appears to be necessitate as theological education. The applicants are prepared themselves to bear the risk of non-employment within the church community. In the subsequent period, five women were admitted to study at the theological seminary. 
For the first time, the liberal and open-minded principal, Rudolf Taut, had directed the preceding call for applications to the seminary not only to men, but to young people. A female pastor from the first generation wrote in retrospective of how she was finally accepted after a two-year assessment process. However, the female candidates had had to guarantee that they would not seek to become female pastors. If she had admitted to this goal, goal or to this calling, then she would not have been accepted into the course of the study. They were only granted permission to study, nothing more. Career prospects were still limited to the congregational areas of children's and youth work, missionary work, or adult education. There were no clear career goals for these first women at the Baptist Seminary. There were lone fighters who constantly had to defend anew the legitimacy of their choice of field of study. Placement in congregational service was also correspondingly difficult, meaning that initially only a very few female applicants were prepared to commit themselves to this high-risk endeavor. In, seven, in 1979, a new commission was appointed by the Federal Council that was to clarify the issue of full-time employment of, of a woman. <coughs> the result was that the employment of a woman would always be valued, desired, and expected on the many levels and areas of the church. On the question of whether, of whether women should also be appointed as pastors, the commission referred to the reconnection of all services in the congregation to the commissionary and authorization by Christ, as well as to the endowment of spiritual gifts received by men and women. This charismatic equality arising for the commission from the New Testament Gospels was to form the theological foundation for an affirmative answer regarding the office of a female pastor. I quote, Despite the fact of not having an anonymous biblical statement, the majority of commission members considered it to be fundamentally feasible for women to be called to full-time service as a pastor in our federal congregation. In recognition of the differing positions and understanding within the national congregation, it was recommended at this time to forego the title of female pastor and to describe the female theologian as theological co-workers. Furthermore, the commission limited the areas of activity and work for the theological co-workers to children and youth work, services for women, national and foreign missionary work, as well as being integrated into the congregation in the area of Christian education. Full-time work would also be achieved by means of the congregational deaconry, with which an agreement would need to be reached. The national leadership agreed to the recommendations of the commission in January 1981, and thereby opened the opportunity for congregations to employ or to call educated female theologians to the outlined areas of theological co-work. The discussions in the Federal Council as well as in the church internal media had, however, revealed just how disparate attitudes were to full-time employment of women. Endorsement and rejection were set up abruptly against one another. Ultimately, the intensity of the debate came down to disagreement over the reading of scripture leading to a crucial test for the national congregation at the beginning of the 1980s. The crisis even extended into ramifications of the staffing of the theological seminary. In the following years, 
female theologians were employed in the widest variety of congregational services, as well as in, na in the national, in national inter-congregational fields of work. The full-time pastoral service of women stood the test. In the GDR, Ursula German was ordained in 1975 as the first female pastor. A short years later, Pastor Carmen Rossol assumed her office in West Germany. It was not until 1992 that the Federal Council agreed to the ruling that congregations and organizations could decide themselves whether or not women that this group had called to pastoral work in accordance with their understanding of vocation and service were in fact to be described as female pastors. In the end, 61% were in favor. To this point in time, there were 14 theological co-workers who professed that they saw and understood themselves to be pastors. I was one of them. The local congregation was viewed as being the key institution in choosing the designation for their female co-workers. Today is not the appropriate place for reporting once again on the diverse and controversial discussions that preceded the revolution. I have actively participated in these discussions, starting as a teenager on the decisive union councils, over the period of my university study, and through to my ordination. In the heat of the conflicts, I received a letter from an older pastor who wrote to me out of concern that the introduction of the office of female pastors was for him the first step on the path to the renewed introduction of temple prostitution. <laughs> and yet, I belong to the first generation that ever though I had been ordained as a theological co-worker, was selected once again by her congregation, this time to be its female pastor. Today, female <coughs> pastors constitute some 12 to 15 percent of all pastors. The long and rocky road has been worth traveling. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? <laughs> Lots of questions, I hope. Yes. Yes, please. Um, so how is it today for women in the OSD? Mm, I think nowadays the female password is established in the uh, German Federation. And I, as I said, in the end, 12 to 15 percent of all pastors are female pastors. But, but, there's um, still a kind of uh, of problematic situation of female pastors at the, the theological seminary because many congregations don't want a female pastor as, as uh, the only pastor in the congregation. They accept them in a tandem or in a, when there is another senior pastor or as a female pastor for the youth. But to be the only pastor in one th a a congregation is quite um, problematic until today, I think. Yeah. Uh, do I understood well? You're being the first generation of... Uh, yes, I of, yeah. Uh, how did your father uh, solve this endeavor? Your father was a pastor as well. Yes, yes, of course. He uh, really encouraged me. At first he was shocked, really shocked, because he thought I could become a lawyer or the medicine or everything else, but not a pastor because it wasn't possible at the time. And uh, he really um, recommended to me to study history, to study history and theology and to perhaps to become a teacher at school. 
But when I entered the Kirchliche Hochschule, he, one day he came to me with his Greek New Testament and his Biblia Hebraica, and he was very proud that I was studying theology. And I think he was really a fan of my study. Yes. Have you noticed or observed any move to uh, increase conservatism yeah. among the German Baptists because of the reunification of East and West Germany? No, uh, in fact, the Baptist congregations in, in the GDR, um, in, uh, in, in, in perspective of female Baptists, were very modern and liberal, more than the Western part of Germany, it's quite funny. Yes, yeah. But they ordained the first female pastor in 1975. Okay. Uh, I'm not quite sure why they are so open-minded um, concerning the female pastors. Perhaps um, because in the socialist um, society, it was totally um, normal, I would say, um, to have uh, a business as a, as a woman. Every woman in, in the GDR had to have a business. I'm not quite sure. That is not uh, written yet, this history. But we have um, fundamentalistic tendencies uh, in the German Baptist Union today. Especially, I would say, uh, a wave on Pentecostal fundamentalist uh, movements. And uh, mm, for me, it's quite stunning that in the Pentecostal fundamentalist approach to um, these congregations, the role of women is so conservative. Yes. And, and it's quite... That would be quite, uh, quite different it. from yeah. American yes. Yes? Uh, Pentecostalism. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your lecture. In the Federation in Germany, what is the method of examination of a candidate seeks to be ordained, okay. and does that provide some more of the conservative elements an opportunity to make obstacles for women yeah. who are following that path? Yeah. Um, I think the perception of calling um, uh, is um, changed in the last decade, I would say. Before, you have to write um, a testimony about your spiritual life and your spiritual biography and about uh, your call. And you have to write this uh, to the uh, leaders of the seminary and to the leaders of the uh, leading com committee of the federation. And then you have to, add, um, you have to um, yeah, you verstehen. Um, there is an interview of the candidates, and then you are allowed to study um, at the seminary. And after um, you finishing or, uh, your, graduating, your graduation at the seminary or at the university, you have to spend, I think, uh, at least one week in a very special um, uh, spiritual retreat um, with people from the leading uh, group of, of the church, and they um, they will interview you once again. I think that um, there is um, a practical problem that many congregations um, uh, are not um, are not eager to get a female pastor because um, they think about. Um, pregnancy and uh, family building and uh, something like that. And that is not so much a theological problem, but a practical problem. That's what I say, what I think. But um, the, uh, the difficulties in, are increasing nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, um I don't know how to approach this. You were saying, you know, the reasons are mostly cultural assumptions about women mm. and the, the course of life and things yeah. like that. But just wondering, also, if it has something to do with the approach uh, to the language, to, to, to the scriptures. As it's as of course. Yeah. And so I was wondering, you know, given the context that you've described, and given the fact that you're saying, okay, this is the history, but 
it is also concerning the present, what's going on now. Yeah. Yeah. So as a pastor, uh, how do you reach out to this kind of community? I'm sure you were in a community that was probably more um, the rural, yeah, uh, forthcoming. But yeah. what, would, what would be your strategies? Do you yeah. do you try and convey something based on on the scriptures? Yes, on yeah. the, um, yeah. I uh, I really appreciated the um, the results of the feminist theology mm -hmm. because they um, detected in the Bible and in the scriptures so many fascinating uh, texts of women mm -hmm. and of women engagement in, in, um, in missionary work and everything like that. And um, the whole question about um, the image of God. Mm -hmm. the, um, and I really, um, pre um, I really, you know, uh, I, I tried um, to confront my congregation with this kind of new approach uh, to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was very fruitful. Mm -hmm. I, but as you know, there, is, there are so many different ways of uh, hermeneutics and how to understand the Bible. And I think if nowadays, uh, in our very irritating times, uh, people uh, people are looking back to some of the traditional um, fundamental um, looking at the Bible as a as a fundament, and this makes it much more difficult for the women today. I think. Yeah. What is the percentage of of uh, women in ministry in the landscape? The, the uh, Lutheran um, Church? Um, I think they are almost 40-50%, I would say. So is there any um, example for the nonconformist groups like Baptists from that? Is there any cross? None at all? No, I don't think so. Oh, when, you, um, when you see the, uh, the, the students of theology, I think nowadays up to 60, 70, 80 percent are female, the, the, the students of theology, to become pastors afterwards. And a very famous uh, theologian in Munich, um, he said, um, his name is Karf, he said there is a feminization, a femin feminization. feminization of the church because so many women uh, uh, are, are trying to become pastors. So does that have a negative effect? Yes, I think. Yeah. And there's no solidarity? No, no not at all. Especially when you are single. As, as, as a single woman, you have a, 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 a very big difficulty. Yes, please. Your, the answer to the original question, when you said that only uh, 12 to 50 yeah. percent, um, and then later you uh, said that um, pregnancy and, and that sort of issue is a concern. So are you saying that preaching and pastoral care and those types of activities are not a concern to congregations in hiring of female? They are, they are, but um, I think there has, uh, there was a special development during the last decades because um, in our congregations the role of the pastor stood um, more and more in the center of the congregational life. And as I think the role of the pastor is so central now uh, in the congregations that the charismatic egalitarian thinking and our ecclesiology is sometimes a little bit forgotten about the, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this approach. What is the significance of the picture? <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a Lutheran pastor, and I was invited um, to preach in uh, the Lamberti Kirche, a Lutheran 
church in the center of our uh, city as a university professor and as a university um, preaching a sermon, a university sermon. 